This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is sponsored by ArtBase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? We think so. Well, ArtBase is the right software to manage your art business. ArtBase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and much more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com now to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount. Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. It was great seeing so many of you in London this past week for Freeze. Freeze London is really one of my favorite fairs of the year. It was so nice to return to London for the first time since before the pandemic. And not only is Freeze London a really good fair, but there are so many fantastic galleries throughout the city who are coordinating to host highly anticipated gallery exhibitions coinciding with the fair. And the museums are, of course, fantastic as well. Interestingly, the talk of the week really morphed throughout the duration of the fair. At first, it was focused on the great energy at the fair and just how nice it was for London to host an art fair again. But then it changed to the focus of a larger group museum exhibition at the Hayward Gallery, encompassing 31 artists at varying stages of their career who are all based in the UK. And I think that exhibition really manifested how many great painters there are in the UK at this moment, and Perhaps it's the most exciting time for the UK art scene since the YBA in the 90s. What was most talked about in the show was a select number of younger artists who are also having incredible commercial success. And then the talk of the week really changed and focused on the auction houses who were starting to have their annual October sales in London, and they featured several of the artists in the Hayward Gallery show, and some of the results were astronomical, to the point of disbelief and even shock. And that really became the most talked about item of the week. So in this week's episode of the podcast, we're joined by Anna Brady, art market editor at the Art Newspaper. Anna was in London on the ground covering all of this, and she's kind enough to join us to help us break it all down. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Of course. So I think Freeze was a really interesting and exciting week containing multiple storylines that changed as the week progressed. It started with the actual Freeze Art Fair, and then the focus was really on this museum group exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in London, and then finally the contemporary auctions at the major auction houses. But before we jump into the Hayward Gallery show and the auctions, Tell us a little bit about Freeze Art Fair. It was the first major art fair in London since the pandemic. How did it go? So it was it was basically London's first big international art fair for two years. It was Freeze 2019 that we were all last doing this. Um, and there was a general feeling of excitement, really. It's a real cliche to say back to school, but that's kind of what everybody kept saying. Um, in that sort of London really came to life. Um, the fair was very... I mean, it it felt like there wasn't really a pandemic going on, to be quite honest, inside the fair. It was very busy. There was meant to be masks being worn all over the place, but um, it was a kind of 50-50 split between people that were choosing to wear them and those that weren't. Um, but there was certainly a very buoyant atmosphere. There was a lot of events going around in, on in London. And so there was a sort of upbeat mood. And I think quite a lot of people hadn't been able to go to Basel a couple of weeks before. So for them, this really was their first big event too and sales seem quite positive too they seem to be going pretty well I mean House and Worth and people like that were ringing sales through the through the till on the preview day and there was certainly an appetite for a lot of young painters which we're going to be talking about as well there was a huge amount of painting there a lot of figurative painting and a lot of works by young artists um as you say a lot of those who are in the Hayward show as well which has been garnering a lot of attention recently um, to get some background as to what the Hayward show is. Yeah, please do. It's called, yeah, it's a show called Mixing It Up. It opened um, a month, six weeks ago, I think. Uh, and um, it's a show of 31 painters from a really diverse range of backgrounds, but they're all working in the UK today. 
And the curator, Ralph Rugolf, is aiming really to present a sort of survey of the UK painting scenes today. It's not just young artists, there are old artists too, like Rose Wiley, Denzel Forrester, Hervin Anderson. Um, but it does include a lot of younger painting, painters who are market darlings of the moment, such as Izzy Wood, uh, there's Mohammed Sami, uh, Shade, Fada Jatimi, Louise Giovanelli, uh, Giovanelli and um, Kutsunai Violet Huami. Um, so it, it's a very, first of all, it's a very beautiful show. And as someone who was told at art school nearly 20 years ago that painting was a redundant medium, it, it really sort of proves that entirely wrong. It's definitely not. Um, they're also very sellable paintings. And if it seems it's to show what it's selling right now, now and very in demand in terms of UK painting, that did that very well. Um, so it did feel a little bit at points like walking through a commercial show or maybe a, a Phillips auction view in part. Um, but when we asked Ralph, Ralph Rugoff about this, he, he really rejected any suggestion that this was a show influenced by all that might influence the art market. He said, I have no interest in keeping up with whatever the art market's doing. It's not relevant to what we're trying to do in terms of offering the public experiences of engaging and inspiring art. But yet his choices did seem very in tune with the market right now. And the show is also being financially supported by various commercial galleries like David Zorner, Stephen Freeman, Tadeus Ropak and Thomas Dane. Um, and then I was looking around Freeze just before it opened on Tuesday. And it was kind of deja vu that it was full of artists in the Haywood show, like Mohammed Sami was to shave. Izzy Wood had a big solo booth with Carlos Ishikawa. Louise Giovanelli was being shown by Grimm. And Andrew Pierre Hart was there with um, Tawani Contemporary. Jade Fadajitimi was with um, Pippi Holdsworth and so on. So, um, and then the auctions happened too with all these young, these young painters, um, some of which are in the Haywood show and some of which aren't. So it all tied together and became something that I really concentrated on looking at last week. One of my favorite things about Freeze is that when you visit London for Freeze, you aren't just going for the fair. There's a lot of great art on view throughout London at galleries and museums. And in terms of museums, I know a lot of people enjoyed the Paula Rego show at Tate Britain, but the Hayward Gallery exhibition was really the most talked about show throughout the week with galleries and collectors saying you need to check it out. It's a big group show. It's a mixed bag of artists, but a lot of big young artists that people are talking about. So I think a lot of people who traveled to London for free saw the show this past week. A few people interestingly told me it reminded them in a way of a somewhat controversial exhibition at MoMA in New York about seven years ago called Forever Now, which focused on a group of about 15 or 20 artists that were very commercially successful and collected by many of the board trustees, and it was criticized by a lot of people because of that. But as you covered in the art newspaper, a number of these artists featured in the Hayward Gallery show were also included in the London auctions that coincide with the fair. So visitors would go to the Hayward Gallery show and then go to the auction preview sometimes on the same day and see some of the same young artists. And then these artists achieved such high prices at auction a few days later that it bordered on shock and disbelief. So tell us, who were some of the most noteworthy artists who had these spectacular results at auction this past week? So I think we'll start with, I mean, we have to start with uh, Flora Yuknovich, who, who was not in the Hayward Gallery show, but she's a 31-year-old artist who's represented now by Victoria Miro. She was represented by Paraffin. And she's really come out of nowhere in terms of an auction presence this year. And her paintings are sort of these big, rich, Rococo-inspired works. She very much studies old masters. Um, and it's <laughs> they're in incredibly painterly. And um, this work at Sotheby's on Thursday night is called I'll Have What She's Having. It was only painted last year and it was only bought last year from Paraffin. And it was estimated at 60 to 80,000 pounds, but it sold for 2.3 million, which is a huge price for somebody who graduated a few years ago and, and has only really come to auction this year. And a few years ago, her prices were in the low thousands. So she was one that w that really kind of came from absolutely nowhere th this season. Another example is the British artist um, Jade Fadajitimi, who who is 28. She was in the Hayward show. And as I said, she was at Freeze as well. And on Friday night at Phillips in London, one of her paintings made in 2017 when she graduated from the Royal College of Art sold for a, um, another record, £1.1 million. That beat her previous record, which was only so set the night before, which was um, 
1,700 pounds. And to put these prices in context, in 2017, when, when both of those works were born, Jardet's paintings were selling for between 6,000 to 10,000 pounds. So, um, and even at, at Freeze London, Pippi Holdsworth, they had a new painting on their stand, which they sold for between 100 to 130,000 pounds. So that illustrates the disparity between these gallery prices and the auction prices when demand far outstrips supply. Another example is Izzy Wood, who again was in the Haywood Show. Again, she um, was born in 1993. And she has her solo booth um, at, at Freeze with Carlos Ishikawa. And on Friday, one of her 2019 paintings on velvet sold for, again, another record, uh, £327,600 at Phillips. And also at Phillips that night, a work that was just finished this year by the Ghanaian-born uh, artist Serge Atikwe Kolotti, uh, which was estimated at 30,000 to 40,000 pounds, sold for 340,000 pounds just over. And the records for Sanya Kantorowski and Shara Hughes and other artists have attracted a huge amount of attention over the course of the pandemic. Um, I was actually reading your report, our tactics report, um, in which your latest report of last week's sales, in which you found that the next gen artists under 45 accounted for 23% of the total sales value last week. So, I mean, nearly nearly quarter, that, that's huge. Um, and it really shows quite what a phenomenon this is with nine records for these next gen artists, lots of them women, including Emily May Smith, um, Flora, Jade, um, Shara too. And meanwhile, some of the older male artists, like Hockney and Basquiat, they're normally the bread and butter of these sales fell pretty flat. Um, so it, it's really interesting. I think it's including these works for the auction houses. It's a low risk strategy for them. These are hot young artists. They know they can sell them. And people don't really even need to come in and see them. People are looking for these names so they can kind of distance sell them quite well. And there seems to be a trend to sort of front load auctions with these um, emerging artists. They five to 10 lots of them before the rest of the sale. And it's particularly good strategy at a time when it's quite hard to get blue chip material, particularly with these mid-season London sales, which are sort of always, always end up being the kind of poor relation to the New York sales in November, which tend to swallow up the really big material. So it's, it's a great strategy for them. It's, it's low risk. They can put these works in. They know it's a surefire sale. And I'm sure they probably don't have to give as much away to the vendors in terms of um, you know, giving them the vendors premium, maybe some of the buyers premium as well, uh, things that they'd maybe have to do to try and secure some of the blue chip material. I'm sure they probably don't have to do the same with these works. So it, it's a sort of interesting phenomenon and one that is being criticized by some, shall we say. I do think the Hayward Gallery exhibition illustrates a level of excitement for a group of rising UK-based artists that we haven't seen since perhaps the YBAs in the 90s. But it does seem like a lot of seasoned collectors are sitting on the sidelines when it comes to these younger artists at auction. The prices seem just too out of control for many of them. So do we have a sense as to who is bidding and buying at these price levels we're seeing at auction for these younger artists? I get that sense too. And as you say, the seasoned collectors, and I would probably be with be with them as sort of sitting by and watching this happen because it feels a bit mad. Um I think who exactly who is buying these is a sort of million dollar question. I, it does seem to be a lot of Asian bidding, bidding on um, young Western artists because we're seeing this at Hong Kong sales as well. Obviously, it doesn't all have to sell to an Asian buyer if it's sold in Hong Kong, but a lot of a lot of things are. A lot of these Asian buyers are also young and they you know like the artists and they're buying the work of younger artists. Um, but I think there's also a sort of special breed of the speculative investor collector who's moving in here. Um, and lots of people who cannot get these works in the primary market. So they're, they're trying to get access through the auction houses. And it feels like this is sort of newer outsider money too, in terms of outsiders to the art market. I don't think this is something being driven by the kind of insiders to the art world. Um, I, it's also interesting that this has happened at a time when algorithms are so powerful in terms of the decisions that we make um, as is social media, particularly Instagram. And it seems like it's a sort of, it, it feeds a frenzy, um, giving people more of, of what they like. And I suppose also when you look at the property market over the past year and a half, that feels a bit unhinged as well. There's a sort of mad competitive frenzy that seems to have taken over people during the pandemic. And I wonder if that's feeding a bit um, in here. And it, it, it's a conversation I've been having a, a lot of with sort of various advisors over the past week. And um, 
the American advisor, Lisa, Lisa Schiff, had some interesting thoughts. She said that there was a time when critical value and investment value were inseparable, but that just isn't the case anymore. And the art market's become more of a fan-based economy. And when you see prices like this for artists who are sort of right out of the gate, more than anything else, it means that it's a, a tradable commodity and bids are based on who's trending. And she said, and I think this is quite a terrifying concept, is you have to follow the conversation on, on Discord or, or Reddit and then speculate. Um, so apparently there are forums on Reddit and things sort of, you know, speculating on who who we should bid on. Wow, that's pretty wild. And also, I think that's a really great comment about critical success and the role it plays nowadays. And really, is it a requirement for an artist in order to have a thriving market? I personally believe it is necessary to have that institutional support in order to have a long-term successful career, but I do think we are seeing a lot of younger, new collectors participate in the art market now, and so I'm curious if that requirement of museum support remains necessary in the future, or maybe things are different now with this new group of collectors. But again, I do think it's important also to look outside of the art market, right? You mentioned the housing market. We have housing, art, crypto, stock market. So many assets are trading at or near all-time highs right now. They're just very inflated. So I think we do need to be aware of that phenomenon when we are examining what's going on at the moment in the art world. But I think a lot of collectors are still watching and observing and wondering, is this normal? Is there a precedent for something like this or are we in uncharted territory? I don't think there's been anything quite like this. I mean, everybody, everybody always points to the sort of cautionary tale of the zombie formulas boom and the rapid and the rapid bust, which sort of was a decade or just under. Okay. Um, With artists like Jacob Cassin, and Lucene Smith, et cetera, but when you look at that, Lucian Smith's record in, said in 2011, that was in fact only, I think, $389,000 and Oscar Murillo's record is $400,000. And that's actually quite small fry in comparison to these prices. So I don't think, certainly in my experience, I don't think I've seen anything quite like this. And I think a lot of people who have got sort of longer and deeper experience in the market than I do, they also haven't seen anything going at this speed. And I think part of the thing is that that trends also they they change so quickly they catch on very quickly now and they change incredibly quickly largely thanks to social media too and I think that's kind of what is what is really driving this at the moment and so you wrote a great article in the art newspaper and you spoke with some galleries and artists whose works are being sold at auction for these incredible prices at a very early stage of their careers are they anxious, concerned? How do they respond to this? They're very anxious and concerned. Um, of course, there's the fact that if one of their artists has been flipped into auction, it doesn't necessarily reflect well on, well on them. So, you know, a few of them, those who are more open about this, will talk about the fact that it's really difficult when that happens because you feel like you couldn't, you should have done more to check out the person who bought that work. You should have done more to protect the artists um so that they're, they're obviously getting more and more controlling about who they sell works to and you, and you get things like 36 month um first refusal clauses coming into sales contracts as well they're pretty impossible to enforce but it's interesting that that's become a kind of standard among people trying to control where these works go to and stop them to get getting into auction um but it, it it's difficult because particularly if somebody has sold, bought one of these works a few years ago when the works were in the low thousands, that collector may not be able to resist nor you know turn down the money promised at auction, particularly if their financial situation changes. So I think there is a recognition that in some cases, you know, you can sort of see the temptation for the vendor to put put these works into sale. Um, so it, it, it's difficult with some. I mean, for a journalist's point of view, trying to get some galleries to actually engage in the conversation acknowledging that this is happening can be impossible some of them will stonewall you as soon as you start asking about auction prices and I'm not sure that's the best way to go about it um not all of them do this I, I have to say that you know Pippi Holdsworth and Grimm and Tawani contemporary people like that that they will engage in a conversation about it but I think everybody is quite guarded about it um um, my cynical side thinks that in some ways with some of the galleries, it does their business no harm to have one of their artists turn into a sort of market superstar like this. Um, you know, they're, they're in the business of creating demand 
and a profile for their artists. So that certainly worked in this way, but then they are very much out of control of it. And um, it's not like the artist sees any return on these huge auction prices. They'll get a small resale, right? But they don't see any of that that money really coming to them. As I said, it goes out of the control of, of the gallery and they are trying to build a, a sustainable longer term career. And when it gets hijacked by a speculator collector that takes it to the, these crazy sort of telephone number figures at auction, they can't do much about it. And I think they're also, they're well aware of how cruel the art market can be to artists, that it will pick up and drop, you know, in six months or a year, year's time. Um, so I think, you know, you're going, you're, they're bound to be very protective over these artists, particularly when they are quite so young, when you've got an artist in their 20s. Um, who people are sort of picking off and running with. And so it feels like this question is on everyone's minds nowadays, but does this feel sustainable? Is there a consensus among galleries, collectors, advisors as to how sustainable this is? I'm, I'm afraid I don't think it is very sustainable. And a lot of people are worried about that. Certainly, certainly not, not for all of these artists. When you look at the statistics, not all of them will carry on making these big prices. And Sadly, I get the feeling that most of the people buying at this level are maybe taking quite a short term view. They're not in it for a long term investment, which is a worrying fact. And, and I think it's the speed that really worries the people who are involved in the market. And the fact that there seems to be no limit to these prices, there's no kind of they're not playing by any kind of established rules. And um, a few advisors don't want to speak on the, the record because they're quite close to some of the art, artists involved. But there is a feeling that it's we're in a deeply irresponsible market at the moment. And I think quite a bit of the blame is being laid at the auction house's door. That's not to take anything away from the fact that I think some of these painters are fantastic and there are some great work that's out there too. Um, and of course, the auction houses are servicing a demand. That demand is there and they will they will service it. Um, but as I said, the art market has a history of being quite unkind to young artists. It sort of picks up and, and drops. And as one curator said to us, it, the art world can be, it can be a place for a young artist's quick success, but also their very fast burnout. And th- their feeling the artist's demand f- for their work kind of can often leave them very little room for experimentation. And so it can kind of risk limiting their, their, their practice and, and development. And um, so it kind of feels like there should be the sense that, that an artist's prices reach a certain level in, in the kind of fullness of time and the old linear progression of how an artist market is made or should be made has kind of gone out of the window. I was speaking to Lisa Austin, who is a Miami based advisor who's been in the industry for 45 years. And she was speaking about how the idea of art as a tradable commodity is something that dates to the sort of late eighties when wall street started to kind of get involved and you've got sort of traders entering the market. And um, this is kind of increasingly upset the normal trajectory of how an artist's career is supposed to go that, that you would be working away for years, decades, you get to a certain age, you have a certain number of museum shows, you get bigger collectors, and then your prices go up. It was a linear progression with its foundations in critical, not commercial validation. And now that's upended. So you can get a 25-year-old artist suddenly go from 20,000 at auction to 500,000 or a million plus. Um, But as Lisa says, while some crash and burn, others hold up. And it's very hard to know who that will actually be. Um, but yeah, it, it's mad because often you can also get these artists are going for huge figures at auction and they have waiting lists for their work in the high hundreds or low thousands. And yet when when a collector goes to give their work to a museum or tries to give their work to a museum, some of the museums won't even know these artists exist. So that kind of shows quite how the tables have been turned and this whole thing has been upended. Yeah, we will absolutely be following along to see how this all plays out. Anna, thanks so much for chatting with us from London about Freeze, the Hayward Gallery Show, and the auctions. We really appreciate all of your insights. And if our listeners want to follow you on social media, where you're reporting on the art world and the art market, where can we find you? So on Instagram, I'm Anna Brady 100 And on Twitter, I'm Anna Brady underscore art. Perfect. Thanks so much again, Anna. We really appreciate it. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Anna. We want to thank ArtBase for sponsoring this week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast. Are you managing an art collection, an artist, studio, or gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? 
Well, Artbase is the right software to manage your art business. Artbase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy to use, powerful database. All you do is enter your data once, and you use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and a bunch more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used in the cloud from any location on any device. So go to artbase.com now to learn more, and be sure to mention our tactic for a 15% discount.